Hello fellow problem solvers. So today we're going to be doing a problem from the 2000 Poland team selection test, problem number six. I suggest you try to spell a normal problem out. If you have a sort of decent introductory level of experience with polynomials and you want to get to a medium level level of experience with polynomials, then try this problem out. And furthermore, try it out for a minimum of 30 minutes, ideally an hour to hour and a half. Not more than two and a half hours if you'd like to go along with us give this a go for the next 10 minutes and now let's begin so we proved that the only polynomial and there's a polynomial in real numbers because we're looking at for all real x that this needs to be true that it satisfies this equation so okay it makes sense like if p of x was x then this would be x squared minus one x squared minus one we'd be good so let's sort of what do you notice about these two sides, first and foremost. And the thing I notice is that, first of all, if a polynomial is of the odd degree, it has at least one at real zero. That's a thing we know about polynomials of odd degree. Because if you look at its graph, its graph of y is equal to p of x, either goes to if the term near the x to the highest power is positive, the polynomial will look something, you know, like this, but it goes to negative infinity as x goes to negative infinity, and it goes to positive infinity as x goes towards positive infinity. If, on the other hand, what's it called? The coefficient near the highest power is negative, then it looks like this as x goes towards negative infinity, it's the polynomial good towards there. And it crosses, to be able to do this, it needs to cross the, what's called the x-axis. So it's going to have at least one zero. Now we can go ahead and say, okay, if that zero is alpha, then I'll have, like first of all, the polynomial is not a constant, because you'd have c squared minus one is equal to c. Actually, constant polynomials are not of an, what's it called, odd degree. So the constant polynomial is like, falls down. But if we have an alpha, we can plug that in and we get that p of alpha squared minus one is equal to minus one. Sure, it seems. There's a thing that's minus one, but there's really every single value is captured if you have a polynomial of an odd degree. So now with this, we can't just go ahead and say like plug in a zero, like it's not giving us much. However, what do you notice about the two sides? What I notice is that here we have an x squared. So I also know that if I, instead of x, I put minus x. Now if you have x squared minus one, that's what minus x times minus x is, is equal to p of minus x squared minus one for every single x. And now what does this tell me? Well, it tells me that p of minus x squared and p of x are the same. In other words, I have that p of x minus p of minus x times p of x plus p of minus x needs to be equal to zero when you equalize them and then write them as a difference of squares. Now, my question for you is, what does this mean? This is true for all x. And it means that either this equation or this equation is zero infinitely many times. So we either have that p of x is equal to p of negative x for infinitely many x. And mind you, if it's for infinitely many, because we're in polynomials, it means it's for all, right? Because if you could write this down, if this is equal to zero infinitely many times, call this a polynomial q of x, then you'll have q of x as infinitely many zeros, that means q is zero. So these two things are identical to them for every single x. Now, could this be the, the case, that p of x and p of negative x are equal for infinitely many x? The answer is no, because as x grows towards, like you can have equality, you can have p of negative one, say, be equal to p of one. Right? You can have a polynomial that jumps around like that. But what you have is that 
as these value scores go towards positive and negative infinity, you're going to have, actually need, you need actually for all x this holds true. So for x that are greater than some value n, we will have that p of minus x, if x is a positive number, p of minus x will be negative and p of plus x will be positive. We notice by virtue of this polynomial being of an odd degree. Or, or it will be the other way around, or it will be like the negative part is po always positive and the positive, for positive x it's always negative. So we can't have this hold true which means we must have for infinitely many x, for every x greater than n, and by virtue of that, for every single x, have p of x be equal to p of negative x. Now, what does this mean? Well, one thing this thing will give us is p of 1 is equal to p of negative 1. But also, mind you, we have it actually is equal to negative p of negative 1. But the important part here is, one, this makes sense with what we are proving. So, you know, you're double-checking your work, saying, wait, I need this. Does this make sense here? Yes, it does. So, the reasoning seems plausible. It seems okay. Actually, it doesn't seem plausible. Like, we can make this very, very concrete. But at this point, it's perfectly fine reasoning. And we have this thing called true. Now this gives us that p of 0 is equal to 0 on one hand. And then p of negative 1 is equal to negative 1. p of 1 is equal to 1. And then if p of x is equal to x, so p of x equals x for some x, say p of x0 is equal to x0, and this implies p of x0 squared minus 1 is equal to x0 squared minus 1. Right? So we have this, we have this. Now, do we have the converse? The converse, like maybe we can get it, like if p of x squared minus 1 is equal to, say we put in x equals to the square root of 2, then we'd have that the p of the square root of 2 here, the square of this is equal to 2 minus 1, which is, what's it called, 1, then plus 1, we'd have this is equal to 2, and then this could either be positive or negative, both are, both are possibilities, though maybe, maybe I'm thinking there's, a, there's something we can say about the fact that this side, if x is very large, right? If x is very large, positive or negative, this side is going to be greater than 1. Right? Polynomials are not bounded by, odd degree polynomials are not bound, bounded above or below. So this side is going to be positive. This is a square, the square of something, minus 1. So x squared minus 1 is going to be positive, which means a polynomial starting from some n, from some positive n, p of that n is going to be of any small n greater than the big n is going to be always positive, right? So maybe we could even have an argument that maybe not the square root of 2, but starting at some point, we always get that p of any number of this form is going to be positive. And we can maybe use that potentially for me. Now here, I would actually invite you to pause with these couple of ideas for the next five to ten minutes while, I'll, while, while I clean up this board over here. And while you notice that you can have, if this is a solution, you can have this a solution. You have this as positive. For, it's at a certain point, this becomes always positive. And here's where I invite you to pause. Now here is the next step. And now that we've cleared this up, let's look at what it is we have here. If you have the square root of 2 is equal to 2, this means that we'll have p of the square root of 2 will be equal to, what's it called? Either the square root of 2 or the negative square root of 2. Now let's see what happens when it's the negative square root of 2, right? Because the then, then we have that p of negative square root of 2 is equal to the square root of 2. 
We also have that p of x is equal to negative p of negative x. And now let's see what happens in this case. So if I was to put in the next one, now let's say I put in, so I made this part, I made it one. Let me make this one equal to, let me make this part equal to the square root of two. Then I'll get that, what do I need? I need x squared minus one needs to equal the square root of two. So I need x to equal the square root of two plus one, and the square root of that. So if I plug in that x, I'll have that p of, what's it called, p of the square root of two, which is equal to negative square root of two, is equal to p of x squared minus one. Now, what seems to be your problem here? Well, the problem seems to be that the square, negative square root of two is positive, is negative, and when you add one, it still becomes negative. It's still negative. And then this square cannot be equal to this. So the square root of two has to be positive square root of two, and the negative thing has to be the negative square root of two. Now, with this in mind, if you didn't figure this out, now I invite you to pause for about 15 minutes and try to see if you can push a problem further still. And here's the next step. Well, now let's talk about a sequence. Let's make this a sequence. Let's make a n to be such that what? Such that this part, when I plug in a x equals to a n, I'll get this is equal to a n minus one. So I'll get that a n minus one squared minus one is equal to a n. In other words, a n is actually I'll get a n squared minus one is equal to a n minus one. And so I'll get that in fact a n is equal to the square root of a n minus one plus one, which is greater than one. If it's greater than one at one point, it's going to be greater than one at the other point. So we have this. And now we're going to prove inductively. We've proved we're starting at a zero is equal to one. Now assume that P of a n is equal to a n, right? Assume this is the case. Well, then you have that p of a n plus one squared is going to be equal to a n plus one squared. Once you get rid of all the parentheses and yada yada. And you get this by plugging in x equals to a n plus one. And then by this recurrence relationship, you will get the thing you need. So now, with this in mind, we have that p of a n plus one is equal to plus or minus a n plus one. Let's assume it's a minus a n plus one. But then for the next one, when we plug in a n plus two, we'll get p of a n plus two squared is going to be one plus p of a n plus one, which is going to be one minus a n plus one, which is going to be less than zero. A contradiction because this is a square. And so we know that inductively then this needs to hold true for the sequence. Now, if this sequence has infinitely many, in, infinitely many real numbers, then we're pretty much done with the problem. If it has infinitely many, let me make it clear, distinct numbers, right? We need to now show that one, this will have infinitely many distinct numbers, real numbers, but also that none of these, yeah, actually that's what we need to, I said distinct, infinitely many numbers that are at the same time distinct. Now, how do we go about proving that? Well, for one, we have, what is the sequence really like? Is it increasing, decreasing? Are we ever going to have that? And x such that x is equal to the square root of x plus one, that x squared is equal to x plus one. Oh, this is the golden ratio. So we might be getting towards 
the golden ratio as time goes on. Huh, that's actually... Though I don't think that's going to happen because when we start at 1... So the only question I really have is whether or not an is greater than am minus 1. And we can actually figure this out. It's greater than if it's below the golden ratio. Like it approaches the golden ratio, its limit is there, but it doesn't get to that point for any, like for any constant number, we will get that all of these are distinct. Now, how can we sort of prove the fact that all of these numbers are distinct now? Like they seem to be distinct. When we're saying if an was equal to am, say am plus n, then could we also go backwards? I think so. Then we could go backwards, 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 and we'd get at some point back to a0 is equal to am, but a0 is 1, and every single one that's after 1 is greater than 1. That's sort of a, I'm sort of doing this a hand, in a hand wavy way, but you can't say, say, an is equal to an plus m. Then what is this in terms of the previous one? Well, it's the square root of an minus 1 plus 1. This is the square root of a n plus m minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1. Square these, you get a n minus 1 is then equal to a n plus m minus 1, and so on and so forth, till you get to a 0 is equal to a m, right? You just keep decreasing n times. You get a 1, a 1 is equal to a m. So that's an impossibility because every single one after a 0 is greater than 1. A contradiction. Right, so that's why all of these are distinct. So we've created an infinite sequence of real numbers which are not equal to each other. That um, what's it called? They have we have an infinite number of we have an infinite number of real numbers x such that p of x is equal to x. And so we have that the polynomial p of x minus x has infinitely many zeros, which means it's equal to zero. And so p of x is equal to x. And this proves our claim. This proves that p of x is equal to x for all real numbers x. And this finishes up our problem. You know, it's a polynomial type of problem where, and this is why I think it's a decent one to practice your polynomial um, knowledge, especially in algebra, because we're not using here, like most polynomials that I've maybe showed, actually not most, but some I've showed usually involve them being using some number theoretic properties, using the property a minus b divides p of a minus p of b. But this is a real algebraic sort of problem in polynomials. And this finishes it up. And I also like the fact that it doesn't use any zeros, complex roots, whatnot, but that it's more real like this. Like you're coming up with infinitely many roots. And by virtue of doing that, you're proving that p of x needs to be equal to x. And this finishes up our problem, and as always, thanks for problem solving.